Um, so, hi everybody. Um, my name is Jane Costello and I am with CITL. I'm an instructional designer and I have a keen interest in open. So, open education, open text, open access, um, and use of open resources in particular. And with me today we have um, uh, Patrick Gamsby. And Patrick, please say a few words. Sure, uh, I'm the scholarly communications librarian here at uh, MUN. I've been here, I'm now in my sixth year. Um, um, before this, I worked at uh, Duke University and Brandeis University in the States. Um, and while at Brandeis, I was a uh, lecturer in the history of ideas. And I'm ashamed to say that I didn't make use of any real open materials at all when I was teaching uh, my own courses. Uh, although I was a scholarly communications librarian at the time, my two worlds didn't collide. Um, aside from maybe making my syllabus openly available. Um, so, if I could do it over again, I probably would do things differently. Um, okay, having said that, today's topics that we're going to go over are um, open access. Um, I'll uh, go into some detail about uh, uh, open access um, and then talk about uh, MUN libraries uh, resources and some external library resources that uh, may be useful for courses. Um, and I'll turn it over to uh, Jane, who will talk about open educational resources or OERs. Um, and she'll also talk about uh, OER repositories and uh, support for open at Memorial. Okay, Patrick, before you get going, just uh, one or two little housekeeping so our um, audience understands. Um, we will, Patrick and I will have our uh, cameras off during the presentation um, simply because of bandwidth issues that have been happening um, more of late. So you're welcome to leave your cameras on or if you would like to turn them off to um, to help um, maintain a solid bandwidth, then that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, you can ask questions at any time. Um, you can either raise your hand uh, by clicking, going to the participants list and clicking on the little hand icon, which is in the very bottom of the participants list, or you can post your question in the Q&A. And um, while one person is speaking, the other of us will keep our eye on the Q&A. And uh, should we miss it, I believe Justina is here as well to help prompt us. Okay, Patrick, over to you. Thanks. Um, within the last couple of weeks, uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education released its annual trends report. And um, I guess uh, it's not surprising that uh, the majority of uh, the items they uh, referenced were related to the pandemic. Um, but a couple of years ago, uh, one of their uh, main trends uh, was actually open access. This is um, the header for the article, a turning point for scholarly publishing. And um, this is uh, almost, I would say, a landmark of sorts because uh, the majority, at least in my experience, of um, discussion around open access is usually within the library world. Um, for example, last year, one of the top trends in academic libraries from the Association of College and Research Libraries was open access. And it's kind of been that way going back uh, well over uh, a decade. But it's nice to know that um, uh, this conversation is broadening to uh, the rest of the academy. So um, in case uh, you aren't familiar with open access, uh, I have a basic definition here that comes from um, Peter Suber of Harvard. His book, he wrote the book on open access, where he defines it as uh, literature, OA literature, is digital online free of charge and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. And I'll go into uh, some of these uh, details as I go along. Um, but interestingly enough, this book um, kind of practices what it preaches and you could Google this um, and actually download the whole PDF for free uh, because his book about open access is open access. Um, Apologies for the tiny font here, but um, I, I have this slide uh, just to show uh, some of the, I guess, differences between different kinds of open access. So uh, there's that many different factors uh, when, you know, thinking or working with open access that, uh, you know, an author or um, a reader has to consider. Um, the reader rights, reuse rights, copyrights, machine readability, 
um, automatic posting and so on. Um, not all open is the same. Uh, some things are more open than others. And this chart comes from uh, the Public Library of Science or PLOS um, that is a major publisher in uh, the open access world. Um, so to simplify things a little bit, what you'll uh, typically find um, when it comes to open access uh, are these things called Creative Commons licenses. So I, I just mentioned Peter Suber's definition um, where he uh, notes that with open access, there are uh, not the same copyright restrictions as you know, traditional publishing. So uh, instead of um, restrictive um, uh, copyright, what you'll find with uh, typically with open access publications are these Creative Commons licenses where at the top you can see um, the most free um, as they call it, license, which is essentially CC BY, which means attribution. Um, when you encounter something like this, all you have to do when you reuse it um, is to um, attribute the source. So you can distribute it, remix it, uh, tweak it, change it, um, as long as you give proper attribution. Um, and as you go down, you can see attribution share alike, um, that uh, this particular license lets you remix, uh, tweak, and build upon the work. Um, um, and you have to give credit and you have to actually license the new uh, creation under uh, identical terms. So this is significant that if you were to make use of material with a license like this, uh, you would actually have to apply the exact same license to your uh, new work. So just below that, attribution, no derivatives. Um, it lets you uh, redistribute uh, the work, um, but you can't change it. You can't tweak it or remix it. Um, and then just below that, uh, you can uh, tweak or remix the work, but um, as long as it's not for commercial purposes, right? So non-commercial. And then just below that, it's a combination of the previous uh, licenses, non-commercial, fair like and at the bottom, non-commercial, no derivatives. So something to keep in mind if you encounter uh, any open access materials is that, um, yes, you can use it, but um, there are limitations, perhaps. Okay, so the, the previous two slides were more uh, about uh, just showing the complexity of, of open access, but really there's two basic kinds in the open access world. One that's called green, um, uh, and that refers to repositories. And the second one is gold, which refers to journals. So this is, you know, just thinking uh, basically about journal articles. Um, so the green repositories means that that's basically where um, uh, the bit of scholarship becomes open access for the first time. Um, and through a repository, it could be something like a thesis or dissertation, or it could be uh, a white paper or a preprint, something like that. Whereas gold open access, that's usually the publisher version of a journal article. Um, so I see there's a message from a participant. Is there a way to track or measure if your creation is being shared and how often and in what manner? I think that would be getting into um, Google Analytics. Um, I suppose you would be able to um, Follow it. Something like Google Scholar uh, tracks that type of um, chain, uh, but I don't think there's an automated way to see how things get remixed um, so easily. Um, if you're using things that are found in Memorials Learning Object Repository, Linny, which we'll um, talk a little bit about later, um, there is actually a code um, added to the um, the URL or the embed code of the object that, that people are using. So that allows us to um, keep track of how often the object is being used. And we do use um, Google Analytics and another analytics tool um, to monitor from time to time um, the amount of traffic and um, where the traffic is from. And uh, the other thing that we do is we ask people to come back and tell us how they're using the object. Um, sometimes it happens, but there's not a lot of, not a lot of uptake on that. Okay, Th thanks Jane and Patrick for that. Um, I was just asking because I was wondering if there's something 
similar to a metric to see how many times your paper gets cited or something like that, if there's something similar for open access materials, because this is something that could be used in a promotion or tenure case, right? If you want to show that your open educational resources are being used effectively or even used beyond your own class. Yeah, and there's, um, you know, alt metrics um, that uh, certain journals make use of that, you know, tracks whether or not it's used uh, in a tweet or blog. You know, um, if your work is being cited in a, say, non-scholarly uh, or traditional scholar uh, bit of scholarship. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, the... I think there will probably be um, I, uh, much more in the way of open access materials available as time goes on, especially here in Canada, because they're, um, for those who receive a tri-agency grant, there's actually a policy on open access that uh, if you get a grant, you have to make the, um, your work openly available within 12 months um, of uh, publication. Um, and that is for the Postprint or the uh, publisher version of an article. So the postprint is the one that's accepted by the journal, but isn't styled by the journal yet. So um, the same content or virtually the same content, but um, yeah, it doesn't have the same font and, and so on. But preprints um, do not conform to this particular policy. And then, of course, the two roots are the green that I mentioned uh, before with online repositories, but not ResearchGate. Um, and gold um, for journals. Um, so it, in the library, we have a research repository that looks like this. It runs on uh, ePrint software um, that uh, can uh, be used for that purpose. But uh, these exist at uh, virtually all the schools, at least um, the moderate to large schools across the country, as well as in the States and around the world. So. Um, uh, at repositories like this, you'll find a variety of different materials, but at, at, in the MUN one, they have electronic theses and dissertations or ETDs, um, journal articles in, in different uh, stages or different versions, uh, white papers, podcasts, presentations, and uh, research data. So um, all those materials uh, can be used for courses. Um, same thing with uh, uh, repositories across the country, say, um, and there's usually some kind of um, Creative Commons license or, or some kind of uh, license associated with the materials that uh, says exactly what you can do with it. Um, so you don't have to ask permission a lot of the time because the permission is already given with the material. I put an asterisk next to research uh, data because um, we don't really put research data in the repository anymore. We have a different system for that, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we also have the, the Digital Archives Initiative or the DAI. Um, and this is different from the research repository um, because it's digitized cultural heritage materials. So you'll find books from the Center for Newfoundland Studies or papers, some videos, maps, and um, there's even phone books in there. Uh, and this type of archive is available again at most institutions, um, openly available at most institutions across the country. Um, so this is handy for, you know, not even only research purposes, you don't have to actually travel to the campus um, when the materials in one of these um, archives, but you can use those materials uh, in your courses. Um, and then not all holdings are there for a variety of reasons because, you know, digitizing takes um, quite a while and there's so much to digitize and uh, copyright won't always allow that, but um, all the materials that are in uh, the DAI have a um, blanket Creative Commons license, which I believe is um, attribution, but can't be used for non, uh, uh, for commercial purposes. Um, we also have uh, open journal systems, which we host um, for any MUN scholar that wants to start a journal, um, we, we host that. And again, this type of uh, journal hosting happens across uh, the country or throughout North America and around the world. 
Um, and the majority of the publications are, are, are usually, um, usually have a Creative Commons license. So all of those articles can be Googled and you can take the article and put it in, in your course, you know, free of charge. And then, um, yeah, I should also mention that the uh, Mun Libraries has an open access author fund, which it's uh, really popular and, um, you know, it's uh, limited, but we can uh, grant up to $3,000 um, USD per author per year it, um, if some criteria are followed. For example, the applicant is a corresponding author on the paper, a uh, journal article, uh, that they retain their copyright, uh, that the article is peer reviewed and it's listed in the directory of open access journals. Uh, no subscription fee is charged and um, we can only uh, uh, provide funding for one article per author per year. Go. Um, so yeah, one other dimension, uh, there's several, but I'll just mention this one to open access is that um, there are hybrid publications. Um, and what these are, are uh, subscri subscription based publications where there's an option for open access. And so if, um, you know, an article is made openly available through that publication. That's great because that would come with a Creative Commons license that would allow an instructor to put the article um, in uh, course shell without any trouble. Um, but as far as publishing works um, in a hybrid publication, that's slightly different because um, say our open access fund doesn't uh, support that and other funds like Harvard's fund, they don't support hybrid publications because we kind of see that as uh, double dipping, like uh, there's the subscription that's already um, paid. And then on top of that, there's usually on average a $3,000 um, American fee just to make one of the articles openly available. So we'll move on from that. Um, so th this is a, a website on scienceopen.com um, that has uh, captured over 80 studies that look at various aspects of uh, open access and uh, citations. Um, some are very specific and some are, are general, but basically the overwhelming majority find that open access publications uh, have a citation advantage over subscription based um, publications. Um, and something that was mentioned earlier, uh, promotion and tenure. Um, some schools, I think this is most prominent in the states. Um, and, and this slide comes from Virginia Commonwealth. Um, they've actually incorporated open access into um, promotion and tenure um, assessments. Uh, so this is a Senate resolution that goes all the way back to 2010. And you can see in the last bullet point um, where the Senate resolution um, notes that the P&T committees should uh, recognize the publication and editorial effort in open access peer reviewed journals um, and so on in an open access repository offers added value and greater public good than scholarship made only available in expensive journal publications. So I think if uh, BCU were to um, uh, revise this, they would in include open courses um, and, uh, that use open textbooks uh, or the professor makes uh, an open textbooks, open textbook for the students in the class. Um, there, there's also open access books out there, uh, several university presses, you can see them here, Concordia, Calgary, Al uh, Ottawa, and uh, Athabasca, where, um, yeah, they can be used uh, completely uh, in a course. Um, and there's usually different files associated with it, like a PDF or EPUB file. Um, yeah, and, and so there are, in addition to books, there are open textbooks out there, schools like UBC and SUNY in the States. Um, there's also a movement called uh, Knowledge Unlatched, which uh, libraries, including MUN libraries, supports, where it takes previously uh, published books um, published in the traditional, you know, bound way and makes them openly available. Um, and you can find a lot of these uh, books um, at the directory of open access uh, books or doabooks.org. Uh, so this is just a screenshot of an open textbook, just to give you an idea. It kind of summarizes a lot of things that uh, I've mentioned already. 
Um, on the right side, you can see that there are different formats, three different readable formats, an editable format, and a print format for this particular textbook. At the very bottom, you can see the Creative Commons license um, that the author has given to it, which is the uh, most free license, if you recall the slide with all the Creative Commons licenses. This one um, just requires attribution. Uh, so that textbook could be adopted by a course and uh, um, the students wouldn't have to pay any money for it, and it could be remixed and reused by the instructor. Um, so in the region, um, the Council of Atlantic University Libraries is actually trying to support uh, open textbooks, just like the one I, I, I showed. Um, so this is uh, the front page of the Atlantic OER website. And so this comes from Call, the Council of Atlantic University Libraries, who support this. And um, there, they offer five grants up to $2,000 um, that they award annually, and they provide support uh, for making uh, open textbooks using Pressbooks, which you can see at the top of uh, the page there. Um, yeah, so that may be of interest uh, to some of you. Um, so this is kind of uh, s slow at the moment, but um, it's picking up steam, I think, uh, across the country. Um, and I should also mention, uh, to loop back to um, a point I made with the research repository, uh, one of the research repository slides, is that um, we don't put our research data in the uh, research repository because we have an instance of a system called Dataverse, and I put the link there. Um, basically, this is a project that uh, has come out of Harvard, and um, there's another open term there, open source. Uh, open source refers to uh, software that um, is, can again be remixed and uh, reused or added on to or forked, um, unlike proprietary software. So using open source software, uh, Dataverse is um, for open data sets. Now, not all data sets that are in Dataverse uh, are open. Um, some restrictions can be placed on it or embargoes, but um, yeah. What that is basically um, strictly for uh, data and um, it can be reused. Again, it depends on the licenses that the data um, uh, has uh, affixed to them. But uh, yeah, I think again, we're growing slowly here at MUN, but uh, Harvard's Dataverse has over 100,000 data sets. And uh, this is worth noting because. Um, uh, I mentioned previously the tri-agency uh, policy on open access publications. They currently have a draft policy for research data management um, that um, will probably have similar implications uh, to the open access policy, which will be that um, grant recipients will have to make their data openly available. So um, this is worth noting, not only if you're going to get one of those grants, but also that there will be um, uh, a, a lot of data available uh, in the future from uh, all of those uh, funded projects that could be incorporated into a uh, course. Um, so just to sum up uh, my part, uh, here are some uh, uh, links that I think are helpful for open access more generally, as well as some specific items. So the open access directory um, that's maintained by uh, Simmons College in Boston, it's kind of a whirlwind tour of the world of open access and has links to pretty much everything. Um, more specifically, uh, there's a link to the registry of open access repositories. So uh, the MUN one is there and so are um, the repositories across the country. Uh, just below that, the directory of open access journals uh, that shows uh, 16,000 uh, journals and has records for over 5 million articles. So that's handy as well. Um, and then below that, uh, open access theses and dissertations that um, has over 5 million uh, theses and dissertations from over 1,100 schools. And um, yeah, they're all openly available. And just below that, I, I mentioned archive. This is kind of a, uh, a physics. It's expanded, but it's mostly a physics um, preprint uh, repository, and it has over 1 million articles there. Um, and if you're wondering about any kind of quality control or anything like that, a helpful website is uh, thinkchecksubmit.org that has um, some checklists for going over 
um, what's a credible source and what isn't in the world of open. And then finally, there's the um, uh, open access libguide, um, which shows all of the um, MUN related resources that I mentioned um, already. So I'll turn it over to Jane now. Okay, great. Thanks, Patrick, very much. Um, before I move on, are there any particular questions that people might have um, so far? Okay, so um, Patrick, if you can continue to drive, um, that'd be great. <clears throat> sure thing. So we're going to, sorry? Sure thing. Oh, okay, sorry. <clears throat> So we're going to spend a little bit of time now looking at open educational resources in particular. And um, in doing that, we're going to look at um, what, it, what an OER is, how they compare to um, learning objects, um, ways um, and reasons to use OERs, uh, where you could find them, and of course then the supports for using OERs um, here at the university. And again, you can uh, interrupt with questions uh, whenever you like. Okay, so let's go on to what an OER is. So it's quite simple. There, there are materials that are freely and openly offered for use that can be adapted uh, for teaching, learning, or development and research. And this definition is generally um, accepted. It's from the uh, Commonwealth of Learning. And it's because the um, the object can be uh, either used, revised, remixed, or redistribu redistributed, um, and, and then the person can retain a copy of it locally so that they can do that, um, it is what makes the open educational resources um, very enticing for the instructor uh, to use, as well as for students as well. Um, there's the open potential to increase access to education and improve the quality while reducing costs. And we know today that the costs of education um, in terms of textbooks for students continues to, um, to, to, to go up. And I th think, Patrick, did you mention earlier about um, the, the uh, rate of uh, increase of uh, textbooks? Um, I had that noted here. No, but I know it's a lot. Okay, yeah, so I think it was something to the effect of um, the cost of textbooks have gone up 2.44 times the rate of inflation since 2008. So they, they continue to rise even higher than the rate of inflation, which is, you know, a little, a little bit uh, concerning. And um, open education resources um, include learning objects. So let's have um, a look at what that actually means. Where's an open educational resource? We mentioned can be freely used, uh, reused, adapted, shared. Um, a learning object is a digital resource that can be reused to mediate learning. So the learning object, you use it as it is. There, there's typically no um, changing of the content in the learning object, no changing of the look or the feel or the way that it's uh, presented. Um, that all stays the same. And you can take multiple learning objects assemble them together to create an OER. And if you find after using it that one of the one aspect or one of the learning objects isn't working, you can always get rid of it and replace it with another learning object or another piece of media um, that, that you feel will work for you. So um, today I thought we'd talk a little bit about why we teach with OERs. Okay, so there, there's a lot of reasons, uh, very good reasons for uh, starting to adapt OERs into your teaching practice. Um, it provides a, a wide range of, there, there are a wide range of variety of types of OERs. 
Um, it could be anything from texts, textbooks, um, activities, media of any sort, um, <clears throat> excuse me, video, audio, um, images, interactive um, activities. Um, it could be H5P objects. It could be, could be any, any of these items. Um, by using OERs, you get to select items that give you the exact content that you need and in a timely manner. Um, relying strictly on textbooks, quite often you're, you're tied uh, to examples or activities that are outlined in the textbook and they don't, uh, which don't always necessarily meet the needs of your uh, teaching situation, the students uh, in helping them attain their learning outcomes. When there's a, because OERs have a low cost, then that makes them even uh, more accessible for the students because there's no cost to them. Ultimately, they, um, good OERs save universities um, money in the long run. And they allow instructors to extend the use of the uh, course material um, both before coming to class as well as after. So you may have material that you're covering in a lecture or a given lecture, and then you can um, you could also select some OERs that relate to the topics that are being covered and either have students uh, work with them before class or after class um, in order to help confirm their understanding. They provide an, um, the alternative approaches to knowledge comes um, from seeing what other people who are knowledgeable in the same field or in the topics that you're teaching what they have to say about the topic or how they talk about the topic. Um, as we know, some students, um, students all learn um, slightly, slightly differently from, from each other. And so having content delivered to them in a variety of different uh, manners can often help overcome some challenges that they might have um, when getting the material from one source alone. And the use of open educational resources also enhances your reputation, both from the students themselves, the student body, from your within uh, your peer group and within university administration, and of course, broader than that, within the growing community of people around the world who are using open ed educational resources. Um, so there's another thing about um, open ed educational resources. Quite often you can collaborate with another person um, from anywhere around the world in creating the OERs. Um, and you, because you, uh, you own it, you can modify it um, and have a fair, fairly quick turnaround time, um, ensuring that the, the best version of the object is out there for people to use. And of course, we cannot forget um, the MOOC, which is a massive open online course. So MOOCs came about as kind of an extension of learning, of using open educational resources. And so some individuals, uh, some Canadians um, in, in large part, um, I thought that it would be useful to take these open educational re resources that were showing up in repositories and create courses that would be open and free to students that use these open educational resources. Um, the developer may or may not have been paid to create the course and um, the courses themselves are either instructor led or self paced. So the students would have to look at um, what the requirements are for enrolling in a particular course. And of course, and uh, there's also the potential for credentialing, um, which is to get a badge or certificate. And there's a lot of discussion um, still about the value of uh, badges as a means to credentialize um, work. Some people feel that it's useful for your own um, 
dossier or portfolio um, that showcases your, your skills. Um, and other people or institutions will actually give students credit if they have received a badge from um, a recognized um, MOOC. So if you, uh, if you have the opportunity to enroll in one, it, um, I, I would strongly recommend it. I recently started one um, on about ORCIDs. I did not get to complete it, but I can go back um, whenever I have time again to focus on it and I can complete that course, which, um, which is wonderful. Okay, so we want to look at how you select OERs. The visual here at the top right hand corner is just um, what, what this is, is, is a, a basically a decision tree on how you select any content for um, your course. You start by identifying the, um, the learning need, um, which is um, articulated in your learning outcome for the course. Um, the learning outcomes being what the student will show you evidence of having learned as a re result of taking the course. Then you would search for the for an OER, like what char characteristics or what are the details, um, what topics it needs to cover, that sort of thing. Um, select an OER, then you can use it and depending upon the license attached, you can uh, revise it, um, you can mix it with other things. Uh, sometimes you are asked, but depending depending again on the license, to share it um, equally out to um, other people. And you can um, adapt it and it, then it becomes part of the core part of your course. And uh, it, it, it's used in your practice on a regular basis or in that course. So things you should think about, again, are the outcomes, the content, the topics being covered, any activities or assessment items, um, whether or not the OER will be suitable for um, for students in terms of um, assessing their mastery of the learning outcomes or activities that they engage with. So basically the OER is not added to a course for entertainment. It, it, it's, it's there on purpose to support the learning. You can consider also um, the reusability, um, how general it is or how specific it is to a particular topic, topic um, how much effort there would be for you to adapt it to your course, and the scalability. Bear in mind that learning that open educational resources can be as big as a textbook or a series of texts or it can be as small as a particular image um, of a trellabite, if you wish. Um, then when we think about granularity, the, the smaller or the more precise or the object is, um, the more reusable it is. Larger OERs tend to be less tend to be less flexible in terms of how they're used. Um, and that's because with OERs, you can basically mi mix and match and, and take multiple OERs to build, um, a, you know, a larger one. So a textbook typically would be used um, either, you know, as it is, or you may use chapters or whatnot from it, or perhaps you could use an image. Um, but then if you look at using the image of the trilobite, you could add video to that, you could add audio to it, um, you could incorporate it in activities or within the content page of notes for your students, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, Patrick um, mentioned the digital rights earlier, so you need to look at the digital rights that are attached to it to determine exactly, um, you know, in what ways you can or cannot change it, whether you can make money from the change, if you're supposed to share it, that sort of thing. And in terms of learning theories or your um, your methods for instruction, there 
uh, none are privileged when it comes to um, OERs. Um, the OER is, if you think of it as a resource for, that's used for your teaching and learning, um, it, it, it is not impacted by any particular um, learning theory or um, instructional method. Okay, so let's have a little look at where we can find OERs. And today um, we're just going to talk about a few of them. Um, on other occasions I've uh, gone to some of these sites and, and kind of looked around, but um, you will be getting a copy of the slides at a later date so you'll be able to, you'll have the, the URLs and you can uh, go have a look um, whenever uh, you have the time. So uh, first we have uh, OpenStax, um, which is a repository of, um, of books, of open books. Um, the Welcome Library Images, that's a European-based um, repository. Um, another great source for images is Wik Wikimedia Commons, as well as Flickr. Those are both great sources. Um, Open Door is a basically a repository of repositories. So it lists all the repositories um, that it knows about from around the world. So you have to submit your repository for review and then they add it to the list if it's, if it's suitable. And um, so the URL and what the repository is about and a few other details are included with that. Uh, we have the Open Textbook Library, and of course we have Linny. Um, Linny is actually built on open source software uh, for its engine, and then it's been um, branded, if you will, um, with uh, Linny. Uh, it, it was formerly known as Store, um, but uh, we have uh, been required to change the name. And some of the objects found in Linny are also um, found in the university's digital archive initiative, the DAI, which Patrick mentioned earlier. Um, so it's uh, their videos and they're the more historical ones that um, CITL and its previous uh, entities <laughs> um, had developed since its inception back in the mid 1960s. So there were about 40 years worth of um, uh, videos uh, contributed to the DAI. And you can find them either in the DAI or in Linny. Um, if you go to Linny, then you'll see, you'll get an embed code where you can then um, paste into your course. And there's other, um, there's other sources for open uh, educational resources. Um, SOLR or Solar, BC Campus Open Textbook, uh, that was mentioned. Um, actually, Google Advent, Advanced Search will allow you to uh, search for OERs. Um, and uh, Vimeo, uh, which is a video streaming service, uh, and uh, Wikipedia. Uh, some of the videos that you find on YouTube can be considered open educational resources, um, regardless of what object you're selecting from where or what learning open educational resource, you have to consider the, um, the repository in which it is found and the object to determine how stable you feel it is um, when selecting it for your course. Um, it has happened that people have selected um, OERs at the beginning of a, of a course only to find uh, three weeks in that it has been taken down or moved. Um, that can that can happen. Um, it, it's pretty rare, but it, it has happened on a few occasions. So, um, Memorial has a few other open archives and this is uh, a range of them. And again, uh, you can reach out to each of these um, archives or their, their offices and, um, and, and see what they have available to you. 
Um, Patrick mentioned the DAI, um, the various libraries um, associated with Memorial, um, the QE2, the MI, um, Medicine, and um, Grenfell, and, and there may be others. Um, Linny, which I just talked briefly about, and MAP deals with um, uh, music and media. Uh, they're over in the Arts and Culture Center. Um, Maritime History Archive, <coughs> that is currently um, in the Math and Stats building. And then we have um, the University Folklore and Language Archive, Munfla, which is on third floor of the Education building. And um, a, a lot of their objects are not digital. Um, some are, and we have taken, um, when developing courses, we have taken some of their objects, which are not um, digital or not available through um, internet access and um, converted them with permission, of course. And then there's always uh, the Newfoundland collection, which is an area over in the library as well. Okay, so there's lots of places to find open education resources. Um, so let's have a look at some of the events that happen regularly. Um, so starting in the fall, we have the uh, open access week. And the last um, five, seven years, Memorial Is Monthla open? I thought there was a fee. Um, Paul, I believe so, or at least um, since working with CITL, um, I had not had to pay anything in order to um, get access to it, um, to review it or to include it in a course. Now, I don't know um, if there are, it, there's a fee structure in pay, place, um, but um, so it, it, if there is, and I've given bad information, um, I'm sorry about that, um, but I'll have to check into that. Thanks for pointing it out. Um, okay, starting in the fall, open access week. The library and CITL over the last five or seven years have uh, come together on numerous occasions um, throughout the year, usually op in OA week or open education week, um, to participate in these international um, events by putting off either, either webinars or a series of uh, tweets um, and uh, um, whatnot to, to encourage and uh, educate the Memorial University community about open access. So um, the open access happens usually the third week of October. Open education is usually early in March. Uh, Patrick mentioned the Atlantic OER Fund. Um, this year the deadline was the 1st of March. And then we have the Open Repositories Conference. This is an international conference as well. And it typically happens in the middle of the summer um, in July um, because of the recent uh, um, international situation with um, COVID, um, the, the, uh, the conference um, was not held um, in face to face. Okay, so uh, to bring things round towards the end, um, there is support for you for using open at Memorial, whether it's open uh, journals, open, open author funding, um, open data sets, um, a variety of different archives, and repositories um, and open educational resources. Um, you can find help with any of that here at Memorial University. So three great places to start are first at Memorial's open website, open.mon.ca. 
Another is with the libraries um, with Patrick. And um, there is thides.library.mon.ca slash open access. And from CITL um, with myself or putting in a ticket to our help center. You can also go to our technology resources site, which is at blog.distance.mon.ca slash technology resources. There's some um, guides there on use of open educational resources and on the use of Linny itself. And then of course, um, CITL manages Linny. Um, and its uh, URL is uh, linny.mon.ca. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. In the time we have remaining, are there any other questions? Okay, that's great. Patrick, do you have any uh, other words? Uh, no, just to say that um, I think um, all of the open education um, items that we mentioned will continue to uh, grow here at MUN. Um, there are some other libraries, for example, Guelph, um, University of Guelph that have uh, an open education or Open Educational Resources Librarian, I think is their title, where they focus um, on OER almost exclusively. So um, I imagine that's something that's gonna uh, happen here at MUN at some point. And um, yes, this will uh, just expand in the future. <laughs>